How many of you guys like stories? Oh, oh nobody. Okay. Well, we'll skip the story. <laughs> we'll just get right on to the other stuff. I like stories. Come on. Can I, can I tell you my story? Beautiful. Okay. There was a king in a nation of Judah. His name was Hezekiah. After being made king, he looked at his kingdom and saw the things had come off the rails. He was going to try to make things right again. You see, his people had wandered away from their God, the God who saved them from slavery and had given them everything they needed. They went to follow other deities that their neighbors had made out of wood, stone, and fine metals. The king longed to bring his people back to the God who loved them and showed kindness and patience even though they operated in open rebellion. Hezekiah reinstated the temple, tore down the places where false worship was conducted, and worked hard to do good in the sight of God. But his greatest challenge was just around the corner. <clears throat> oh, I looked up. I know it's some of the 14th year of his reign. In the 14th year, as the king of the, of the, as the king, the terrible Assyrian army led their king, led by their king Sennacherib. Does that make sense? That was confusing. So the Assyrians are coming and is led by Sennacherib. They camped outside the city of Jerusalem. Now this was a huge army. You see, the Assyrians were the leading power in the world, and if they wanted to see your end, they made it happen. To make things worse, this army had just recently swept through Judah's cousin's land to the north. They destroyed their cities and carted the people away. This would have been fresh on the people's mind, as now the Assyrians look to do the same with Jerusalem and Hezekiah. Hezekiah didn't know what to do. Defeat was imminent. So he raised his face to the sky and said, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God, God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven, you have made earth. Give ear, Lord. Hear me. Open our, your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. Hezekiah was hemmed in, nowhere to go, wondering what to do. And what was the result of his prayer? Would God listen to his prayer? Would he forgive them for years and years of rebellion? Here's the answer in verse uh, 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp, withdrew, returned to Nineveh, and stayed there. Isn't that a great bedtime story? I was thinking about that. I was like, you know what? I was thinking about last night telling my kids, so, so like the, the army went to sleep and 35,000 never woke up, you know? <laughs> good night, kids. I thought that would be pretty good. But uh, I'm going to save that one for tonight if they don't listen. We'll see how that goes. We're in the middle of a series this summer on prayer. And if you guys have just kind of jumped in like I have, I haven't really been here. I've been down the hall. But we've been focusing on the Lord's Prayer. And I thought we'd say it right now. Pastor Dan actually said. He gave me very few instructions except for the fact he said, you need to say the Lord's Prayer. So here we go. This is what Jesus told us when he was asked, how should we, how should we pray? This is what he said. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, as a kid, I, I remember memorizing this and I remember thinking that the Lord's Prayer sounded a lot like the Borg off Star Trek. You guys, anybody know those guys? Oh, they, anyway, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Side point. Today we're going to be focusing on, we've kind of been taking little pieces of the Lord's Prayer, and we've been uh, looking at, at each one as they, as it kind of focusing on, because Jesus taught us how to pray through this. So today we're going to be looking at, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we think about God's kingdom coming, well, obviously our minds should go to the, king, the kingdom that was promised to King David, that God was going to, in the future, establish this kingdom and we know now that it was Jesus. Jesus is going to set up this kingdom someday that's never going to fail. And those of us who are followers of Christ, we're a part of that. But I think there's more to it as well. When we pray for God's kingdom to come, there's an aspect that, like, as Christians, we're not just supposed to sit around and wait for the kingdom of God to come. In fact, we are bringers of the kingdom. The things that we do, the things that we say, we actually have the ability to bring it. I read this in a book. We are to fight darkness with light, fear with faith, and hate with hope. When we do these, we are bringing God's kingdom to earth now. But fighting this kingdom is a little bit tricky because sometimes we don't really know 
how to go about that. Because as we see here in uh, the book of Ephesians, it says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces, forks, (laughs) spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. What is our weapons? What is our weapon when we think about these spiritual forces, these, this, this idea that God's kingdom is being attacked and we have to fight back and repel evil. What is it? Well, in this section in Ephesians, Paul talks about the armor of God and then he concludes with this. He says this in uh, verse 18 of the same chapter. And pray in the spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep praying for the Lord's people. Prayer. Prayer is it. And if you're a Christian, you're like, yeah, I know, I know. Prayer is, prayer is the thing. That's what we do. We read our Bible and we pray and we're good Christians. But I think that when I was preparing for this sermon, it was like a really, a really big prompting of, of, of the fact that we really need to pray a lot more. Prayer needs to become not just a part of, you know, my typical quiet time with God. But uh, Paul says elsewhere that we should pray unceasing. That it should just be a constant conversation with God. And when we get together as God's people, there should be powerful moments of prayer where we expect God to do wonders amongst us, where we expect him to move on our behalf and have this, this power that actually pushes back darkness. <clears throat> Just kind of like the king of Sennacherib. He got pushed back, and I don't know how well you know the story. I didn't go into too much detail, but he was pretty cocky. Well, he'd only taken over the, free, the whole world, so I don't know why, but he really thought that he, Judah's God was going to be just like all the other ones. He was going to throw it on the fire and be done with it. And just like he was repelled, I think we can do the same kind of thing with the evil that surrounds us in our world. It might seem kind of drastic to compare what Hezekiah and the, the Israelites were facing in Jerusalem to our situation. And as I thought about it, I was like, you know, that might be a little extreme. But I did some digging. And I think in order to understand a little bit more of what they were truly facing in Hezekiah's world, we have to pause the story where we did and rewind a little bit. And I want to introduce you to a guy named Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah, and he was a pretty rotten dude. But at the same time, maybe I shouldn't pass judgment. Let's see what the the Bible says about him. And this is in 2 Kings. It says, He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and sacrificed his son in the fire, engaged in detestable practices of the nations of the Lord, the Lord that had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops, and under every spreading tree. So yeah, the Bible said, yeah, this guy, he was, he was a jerk. He was a terrible, terrible king. And he took the people away from God. If Hezekiah brought reform and started, he, his father went the opposite way. He decided, you know what, I, I'm going to, I need some stuff. So he started looking around. He said, oh, I'm going to travel over to this country, and I'm going to take and be a part of their worship services of these gods. Oh, and I'm going to bring some of these gods back to my people. And it says he set them up in areas of the city, in the high places around this country, and led the whole people into a time of worshiping other gods. Yep, he was, uh, he was a pretty, pretty rotten dude. I thought, it was, I thought it was interesting when I was, so, I, you know, we can kind of read this stuff, and the Bible is pretty good at hiding sensitive topics and not really being too explicit in things, but I did a little bit of research into what, what was the, the, what were these people doing? When it says they were worshiping gods of, of stone and, and sacrificing their son to, to gods, what, what was that all about? Well, that one sounds, that one sounds pretty bad. The, I, I found that in this time period, there was a god named Molech that, the, that he demanded child sacrifice. That was a part of one of the gods that the people had gone to. And I found it very interesting that this god, Molech, with hundreds of years before the story of Hezekiah, God actually warned them specifically about Molech before they were entering into the promised land. As we flip over to Leviticus, and I know you're getting excited now. You're like, man, this is going to be a good sermon now. We're going, we're going to the good stuff here in Leviticus. Uh, we're going to go to chapter 18. And as we, if we look, if you're flipping there, and you look at the start of, of the, the book. Oh, beat me to it. You know what? It's okay. As you look at the start of the chapter, he's talking about, okay, you know what? You've got to leave the gods in Egypt. Don't bring any with you. And you're going to be going to the land of Canaan, and don't, take, don't, don't worship any of the gods there. And then it goes into this long list of, of things about uh, the, uh, it goes into things about sexual practices that are just not befitting of God's people. There's this whole long list. And so let's read, let's read this. 
Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife, and so defile yourself. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech. There's that name. For you must not profane the name of the Lord your God. Do not have sexual relationships with a man as, does, as you do with a woman. This is detestable. And so as we, I, I just thought it was interesting. It's this whole list of sexual activities that are not good. And then there's this thing about Molech. And I thought, hey, wait a minute. This is, this is a little bit odd. Why is this here? But it turns out that God is addressing what he started, like worshiping gods. This whole section, while it does pertain to our, our lives, and a lot of times when we read this, we would bring it to more to our home life, the way that we should live personally. But this was a direct command of God to say, avoid worship in this manner. When you go to these gods, they're going to demand this stuff from you, and I find this detestable. This is not the way you should be conducting yourself. <clears throat> God was saying that when you go to a culture, don't get caught up in it. And it's so easy to do. It's so easy to see things going on, the, the norms, and we just kind of grab onto those things. Unfortunately, throughout history, this was not the only time. Ahaz was not the only king who led his people astray. And time and time again, this happened. So Hezekiah, when he took the wheel, he was, he was running a kingdom that was lo- living for pleasure, comfort, and they were willing to do just about anything to get it. If they had a bad crop or someone was sick, it was time to talk to the gods. It was time to offer a sacrifice. And they thought, you know what, the greater the sacrifice, maybe then the gods will hear us. Maybe then we'll, we'll be able to see. We won't have to feel this hunger anymore. We won't have to feel poor. We'll be able to do more. We'll be, have a better life if we sacrifice. And as we saw, I mean, some of the times the sacrifices were incredibly steep. But they did this, and I'm sure Satan smiled the whole time as his people were being led astray. Because there's one thing about sin is it's kind of sticky and it kind of tangles us up. It kind of gets all wrapped around us. And the further down the trail we go, the further we go from God's blessing. And, and what we tr- meant to make our lives better, we look back and say, man, I don't know. And so we try to just cover up, try to take, make ourselves more comfortable. They wanted wealth, more livestock, and all this stuff. They had hoped that they would receive the blessing of the false gods. At this point in my studying this week, I, I started to see the scary similarities between our world and the world of Hezekiah. And I don't know about you, but I have the tendency when I'm reading the Bible to kind of always be like, man, those people were dumb. They were so dumb, right? Like, I can't imagine. You, you know, you have these incredible stories, and your grandfather tells you, oh, yeah, the Jordan was held back, and we came in, and Jericho's walls fell down. This God, this God— Oh, hey, there's a stick. Let's go pray to that stick. Like, how, that's what I started, uh, I, when I grew up, I thought that. But the more you realize, you know, you know what, this human nature is so deeply inside of us, we can relate to far too much of this stuff. Luckily, we don't gather around at the woodcarver shack to see what they're going to be worshiping this week. But we do serve dedi- and dedicate th- our lives to things that pull us away from God. In so many ways, we see people rejecting God's way of life. We go off in pursuit of what we think will make our lives feel better. Yeah, I, I think sometimes people think, you know, I just want to, I see kind of two approaches. There's more. There's definitely more. But they want to see their dreams come true, so they try to do hard work and get there. And they lie, they cheat, they steal, they elbow their way to the top, trying to find the dream and the hope. The other thing is, sometimes people just are lazy. They get, and then once they're lazy and they don't produce and they kind of feel depressed, and no matter which way you go, whether you're kind of the, I'm going to go and get crazy or I'm just going to kind of give up and wallow, we end up finding ways and we try to find stuff that we can patch in our lives and make us feel better. Uh, whether it's drugs, porn, Snapchat, relationships, anything is quite possible. Probably there's so many, there's so many tendencies and, and things that we can trapped in our world because it's so prevalent. And as I took time to actually think about it, our world is not serving God. And you guys might say, well, yeah, sure. But think about that. For the most part, the things that we encounter on a day-to-day basis are not pushing us towards God. They're pointing us away. And so just like Hezekiah was hemmed in, I wonder if we actually are in a similar place today. Much like biblical pagan culture, our, our culture has brought sex to a whole new level. In most songs, movies, shows, toothpaste ads, sports, everywhere, I've been shocked uh, in the past, uh, I think it was last year I was at Connect, and the conversation that these young kids were having was disturbing. But it's everywhere. 
it, it's, it's understandable because everything they look at is telling them about how this, this awesome, cool sex is everywhere. Sex is okay. It doesn't matter what, what you want to do. It just anything goes. And it's absolutely everywhere. We are completely bombarded. And I think that's similar to the world that was being, being put in back there. I read a really disturbing stat, and I wondered about telling you, but here it goes. Um, I, the, the estimated age when pornography is introduced to children is around 11 years of age, but new studies are saying that more likely eight years of age is when the majority of, of people are being introduced to pornography, little kids. And this is starting to change the way they think. It's starting to affect the way they view themselves. It's starting to do incredible damage that w and without the grace of Jesus will be irrevocable. It's setting them on a, a path of life that they're going to struggle with for a long time. And this is just becoming a cultural norm for us. Our world is truly obsessed, obsessed with sex. The reason, the reason I tell us this stuff is I think as Christians, we're really good at just kind of doing the, you know, I'm going to read my Bible and I'm just going to pray and I kind of keep the blinders on. I don't really look at what's going on in the world too much. I don't, wanna, I don't want to. It's uncomfortable. I'd, I'd rather just kind of believe that things are going to be good and Jesus' kingdom is going to come without me um, working and, and doing anything to push the, and advance the kingdom myself. Um, so the two things, there's so many different things that we could look at that our world and things that are similar to back then, but there's two things I really want to focus on. The second one is this whole idea of, of child sacrifice. And I thought, you know, there's no way this really relates, but then uh, this next part truly brought me to tears. In the last five years, from 2013 to 2017, 199,557 abortions were performed in Ontario. Our culture is obsessed with me, myself. It is obsessed with what makes me happy in this moment. We're not living for other people. It's what can make us satisfied, what can make us happy. And if we start to step back and look at the big picture of where we're heading, we are so much in pursuit of comfort. And if that's what, if that's what the Israelites were doing, it got them no good. I think it's getting us no good either. And when I talk about the, the battle being won, once again, it's not about the people who are necessarily doing these acts and pushing this. It's th our battle is not against them. It's not against flesh and blood. We are fighting for them. We are loving them. We are going to pursue them and try to show them the love of Jesus. The, oftentimes we look at things in the Bible and it seems completely upside down. It looks like it looks like that, that just, that's just not how life works. But oftentimes, things look upside down when you're the one hanging upside down. This is what it says in, Philad in Philadelphia. In Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Man, if we could only apply the principles of the Bible, how much more sense would life actually make? When we're looking for comfort, or we're looking for purpose, if instead of saying, you know what, if I just try to escape from this moment, this, I just, I'm just not loving my life. I just gonna, I'm just going to watch a whole entire show on Netflix, and for those five hours, I'm not going to feel anything. I'm going to be able to escape. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's a sexual addiction. Maybe it's thing, all these things that our world is running to for satisfaction. But really, when we're done, and I think we can all attest to it, it's not fulfilling. If we applied the principles of the Bible and we live for others, man, we would have so much more purpose in our lives. We would start to be moving closer to God, and we would start to see the foolishness of the things we chased before. When we're caught up in it, we don't see the foolishness. We don't see how, how crazy things are. And so I ask you this, even with these two topics we've talked about now, do you think it's time to pray? Do you think it's time to ask for a mighty act of God in our midst? To say, you know what, we're tired of losing we're tired of losing the battle. We're tired of having these hemmed in moments and, you know, we're going to have to keep our faith to ourselves and keep it quiet. And it just seems like we're getting boxed in, boxed in, boxed in. And how long is it going to take and how many victories are we going to give the enemy before we get to our right, our, our power, and pray for what God could do in our midst? <clears throat> the more I pondered on the, the situation... I just kept going, coming back to the situation Hezekiah faced. And what an, incredible, what an incredible parallel. I was thinking, as I was praying for this, this uh, message, God really convicted me that my prayers were all, God, be with us on Sunday. 
And I felt like God said, you need to pray that God does stuff on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. That we are pe- become people who pray. That when we see an instance, we don't say, oh my goodness, I can't believe the government. Did you see that? Or I can't believe, I can't believe. We're good at talking about it. But are we good at talking to God about it? Are we good about getting serious but saying, you know what? These people that are making these mistakes, they're not going anywhere good. And maybe I need to intervene. Maybe I need to intercede on their behalf to God Almighty to come and act. As I was preparing for this, this message, I, I read a really a neat book. And it was called Prayers That Shook the World. And it was full of stories about revival. Stories of little old ladies in Scotland that got together to pray all night for a couple months. And then a revival broke out in Scotland. And hundreds of people came to know the Lord. And stories like that time and time again where it started with prayer. People who would go to the mission field because they thought God was doing them. And they would go and they would just pray until people went there. One guy said, God, you give me souls or I'm going to die. Give me souls or I die. And he said, I want to bring someone to Christ every single day. And this was, I think, in Syria in the late 1800s. And he brought someone to Christ every day of his life for three years, I think, while he was there in Syria. That could be the wrong place. I read a lot of different stories. But anyway, the point of it is, it was amazing to see what God has done in the past. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the great things being in the past. Reading about this great, awesome God in the Bible. Reading about these awesome stories through our history. And I wonder, sometimes we point our finger at God, but then we still want to do our own thing. Maybe it's time for us to take it seriously, the call of uh, what God has put, uh, put on us. So today, we left the message a little bit shorter because it would be kind of hypocritical to say we need to pray and to, for me to just talk the whole time. So I'm going to ask uh, the band to come on back down here. And what I want to do is, as, as these guys are playing... Let's think about what it is that we should be praying about. What is it in our culture that we need to go to war for in this moment? Is it possible that in Collingwood, Ontario, in a little cinema, that we could actually start to affect change in this world, to start to bring kingdom, the kingdom of God to us, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what I want to do during this time is spend some time to discerning God's will, just like it's Jesus told us to do when we pray. To sit there, allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide your thoughts. And then uh, as, as when we feel we're ready, we're going to come together. We're going to um, raise our voices. We're going to pray in our heads. We're going to pray that God would move in a mighty way because I think it's time. I think it's time that his, his people prayed. Let me read this verse to you that is a promise from God. And it was kind of the, the, the song that we sang beforehand too. When I shut up the heavens so there's no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send plagues among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Heal their land. Uh, Brandon, maybe as the song's playing, just leave that verse up on the screen. That we can call on God to fulfill his promises. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 